Is learned non-use interfering with your rehab potential? And if so, is it possible to reverse this process and regain even more movement than maybe you think is possible? That is the topic of today's video. If you're new to this channel, I'm Tara, I'm a neurologic physical therapist. And on this channel, we talk about anything and everything related to mobility, health, fitness, mindset in the context of neurologic injury with the end goal of empowering you with as many tools as possible to reach your highest maximum level. And all that being said, today we're going to cover a phenomenon called learned non use. I'm going to talk about this term a little bit more, what this term means, why it happens after you've had damage to your brain or your spinal cord. And of course, things that you can do to reframe how you look at the injury to your brain and real applicable things that you can start doing today and maybe even promote more arm and leg movement, whether you're one year out from your injury or you're 10 years out from your injury. So first and foremost, big picture, what is learned non-use? In the context of neurologic injury, it's the suppression of particular movements irrespective of damage to the actual movement part of the brain or the part of the brain that controls that movement. In other words, it is losing a particular movement in the arm or their leg as a result of a learned behavior that gets hardwired into your brain in the weeks and months after your neurologic injury. So why exactly does learned non-use happen? Well, in the days and the weeks following your injury, your attempts to move that arm or that leg are unsuccessful due to the weakness. Then as your neurologic system recovers, you may not even attempt to use the arm or the leg because of those failed attempts early on. And then as we know, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so this cycle just keeps repeating itself. You attempt, you fail you further suppress that movement. And then this behavior turns into something that becomes permanently hardwired into your brain. Now, before we get into my thoughts on whether or not you can reverse this, let's first briefly talk about why you lose movement in the first place after you've had damage to your brain. The common misconception is that the area of the brain that controls the arm has been damaged and therefore you can't move the arm. It's a little bit more complicated than that. There's actually a few different areas of the brain that can be damaged that can impact arm or leg movement. One is, of course, the cortex that controls the arm or the leg. We call that the motor cortex could be damaged, and that would impact your ability to move the arm or the leg, which would look like weakness in the arm or the leg. But then there's also could be damage to the somatosensory area of the brain. That's another part of the cortex. And the somatosensory area of the cortex is responsible for receiving information from the body. Or you could have damage to the thalamus. Some of you might have been told you have had a thalamic stroke. That would be damage to the thalamus. And the thalamus is really the processing center. It does a ton of stuff. So it receives information from the body and processes it. It also receives information from that motor cortex. And it also receives information from the cerebellum, which is responsible for movement control or coordinated movement. Also receives information from the brainstem and the basal ganglia. So it's kind of like a main hub and damage in this area, obviously, because it is a, like a processing center for so many areas of the brain, you could also potentially lose voluntary movement in the arm or the leg. But what you see in those first days initially is not really the full picture. And how you present in those days right after your injury, whether that's a stroke or a brain injury, yes, is the result, if we're talking about an ischemic stroke, is lack of blood flow to those areas of the brain based on a clot in an artery, blood flow stops, nerves die. In the nerves that die, you will not regain function of those particular nerves. But then there's also an area right outside of that where the nerves don't necessarily die. Those brain nerves don't necessarily die. They're just kind of asleep because they're not getting adequate blood flow. They haven't lost blood flow, so they're still viable. They're just not acting at their full potential. And then in those first few months after recovery, you kind of have this process of like kind of spontaneous recovery, meaning that those nerves that were just kind of asleep and maybe just suppressed, they kind of wake up a little bit. That's why you see a lot of progress in those first few months. Now, physical therapy, of course, is critical during this time 
because those nerves that are just kind of asleep, you want to promote their activity. So you want to be doing all those motor control activities and really facilitating movement to get those areas to wake up. Because again, if you did nothing after in those days and those weeks, those nerves that were maybe quiet will eventually become totally inactive. So physical therapy is really important. And the earlier you start physical therapy, the better to again, wake up those areas. But yes, you do see the most recovery in those first few weeks or months because of that process, that spontaneous recovery. On the other hand, during that time, those first, those days, those weeks, those months right after injury is also when your brain is primed and ready to reorganize around this idea of learned non-use. In other words, this behavior or this failed attempt at moving that arm or that leg will result in further or can result in further degradation of that area because of the fact that you're just not using it. And then that lack of use, this behavior now becomes a habit and now becomes your new normal. So now the million dollar question, is it possible to reverse learned non-use months and maybe even years after injury? Well, maybe and maybe not. I can honestly say there's no data out there, strong evidence out there that says everyone who has a stroke is going to get 100% of the recovery back. There's a lot of factors involved, how long you were in the hospital, how big the area was that was damaged, what area of the brain was damaged, your family support, your ability to cope. There's so many factors that'll determine how far you will go. But generally speaking, there is always an opportunity, whether big or small, there's always an opportunity to learn a new habit. So yes, I do believe there is potential to reverse this idea of learned non-use. So here are my thoughts on how you can do this. First, it starts with one idea or two ideas that I think are super important for you to adopt in your brain right now and really start to believe. One is, is that there is growing evidence that that kind of negative brain reorganization that I talked about, where your brain becomes hardwired to just not do these movements because it learns not to do these movements, is reversible through a mechanism we call activity dependent plasticity. I've done an entire video on that and I will link that video, but it's basically the idea that if you present new challenges to your brain or to your body, new movement challenges or new experiences, your brain can reorganize around those experiences. In other words, your brain can build new con connections to successfully complete a task that it is presented with. And then the other thing I think is super duper important for you to start believing today. And that is that some of the movement you've lost might not be due to damage to a motor part of the brain. Now, the most common area for a blood clot to occur is what, the middle cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery supplies not just the motor cortex, the motor part of the brain, but it also supplies that somatosensory area of the brain or that part of the brain that gets a lot of information from the body, or you may have damage to your thalamus, which could also be the reason that you lost movement and not necessarily because you had damage to a motor area of your brain. I actually have a patient right now that had a stroke that primarily affected his thalamus, and he has developed some severe, pretty significant neglect. And neglect will in turn suppress your brain's ability to do coordinated movements or task specific movements using that arm or that leg if it's not getting good information from the body. So maybe it can't feel at all and maybe your brain decides that there's not even an arm over there. And so maybe that learned behavior is just because this lack of input coming from the body into the brain. Nothing to do with the motor area. And I think that's really important to understand because maybe it's just a little bit of your motor area, but maybe you lost movement primarily just because you can't feel it. And there are strategies to 
relearn how to become more aware of that arm or that leg. And if you've only been working on the motor component and you haven't been working on that sensory component, then maybe that's why you've plateaued or you've hit a spot where you're not really getting any more movement. For instance, that person that I'm talking about that had the thalamic stroke, unless someone is standing over the top of him and telling him to use that arm, he doesn't use it. So even though he can move it, and if I ask him to move it, or if I ask him to grab something, he does, but 99% of the day, he doesn't do anything with it. Because if someone's not asking him to do something with it, it's kind of like his brain isn't getting any information to even tell him that there's an arm over there. And so then that learned non-use becomes habit, an ingrained habit. Not because a motor area of the brain is damaged and he can't control it, but because he just doesn't feel it. And maybe that is you. So those two things I think are extremely important first and foremost before we get into some of the strategies that I'm going to talk about. Now, why do I think it was so important? Why did I spend so long going over those two things that I think are so important that you understand that brain reorganization is possible? through activity dependent plasticity and that maybe in your situation, you still do have motor control over that arm or that leg, but you're just not getting good information. The reason I think those two things are important is because of all the data that we have that intrinsic motivation plays an extremely important role in relearning a motor skill. So before I go into this next section and how it links up to the first section, I want to repeat. It does you zero good to keep reinforcing a thought pattern that says your brain is damaged and you cannot regain movement. I cannot think of a more detrimental thought process that you could let into your brain. Everyone has potential to be at least 1% better. So maybe you don't want to be pie in the sky and say you're going to get 100% recovered. But I think it is better to say I can be 1% better tomorrow than I am today than it is to ever, ever, ever repeat to yourself, my brain is damaged and that is why I can't move my arm or my leg. So if there's any take home message from this video, I hope that is the one that you will remove from your brain starting right now. Now let's get back to this intrinsic motivation that plays a critical role in movement retraining. Intrinsic motivation is the foundation for learning in general. And in my opinion, the root of intrinsic motivation is believing that you are capable of helping yourself to restore normal movement. We call that self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a huge part of intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is a huge part of learning a new motor skill. So if you can't wrap your head around everything I just said, then this next section I'm gonna get, get, in, get into, which is actual therapeutic interventions, is meaningless. So again, I really think you have to understand that. I think it's extremely valuable and I think it'll play a critical role in your ability to keep recovering movement or restoring movement. Now, what are some of the big picture concepts of the therapeutic activities? Well, first and foremost is movement retraining. That should be the bulk of everyone's therapy program movement retraining, movement retraining, above and beyond any novel treatment, above and beyond anything else I'm gonna talk about, movement retraining. Let's go all the way back up to that learn non-use. How did it start? It started from an unsuccessful attempt, a failed attempt, a failed attempt to move that arm or that leg. So a successful attempt to move that arm or that leg is going to reverse that learned non-use. So I get a lot of questions about a ton of different treatments, but I do think that the bulk, 90% of your treatment program or your therapy program, if you want to restore normal movement and undo this learn, learn non-use is movement. So there are some critical things that I think get missed or skipped over in a lot of rehab programs and is 
probably the reason why learn non-use becomes so ingrained. One is, is you wanna set yourself up for success every single time. Go into a movement with the intention, knowing exactly what movement you want to accomplish and set yourself up for success. That means finding the right level of difficulty, not choosing an activity that's too hard, but putting it at a level where you can be successful at it. That's gonna stop your brain from suppressing that particular movement. So when we're talking about the arm, gravity eliminated exercises are super valuable. Also anything where you can remove friction. So instead of just sliding your arm on a table, maybe suspend your arm or put a towel on a table, but gravity eliminated, gravity assisted, or band assisted are all ways to make a movement easier. So this is horizontal abduction. Now I'm introducing this air splint. I really like this air splint, especially if you are someone that gets a lot of involuntary elbow bending. The air splint is a great tool that deep pressure kind of helps to inhibit that bicep a little bit. So you can really just focus on that abduction. So this is horizontal abduction. And again, you want to try and keep your chest up and make sure you're not rotating your shoulders. You really want that movement coming from the shoulder and not from your trunk. And again, just pushing that out to the side. So this is a shoulder external rotation exercise. This would be gravity eliminated. Now you can see I try and use household products whenever possible. This is just a Swifter. What I like about the Swifter is it's had a pivot so it swivels a little bit. And then I'm just using one of the blue straps that I use with a lot of my exercises just to help keep the arm on the Swifter. And then just a couple of weights to keep the base of the Swifter in place. So I like the PVC and it's got a little piece of PVC on the bottom just to kind of make it more of a rounded surface. And then for this exercise, what you're just trying to do is we're trying to isolate external rotation. So this is what you would do in the beginning stages of getting active movement back. If you have a lot of tone or a lot of spasticity pulling that arm in, you really wanna make sure that you spend a lot of time on this exercise, really focus on just letting the arm relax. So you can see if you get it past a certain point, it's almost gravity assisted, meaning gravity is helping that arm to externally rotate. The further in you go or the more angled out that you put the base, it's kind of like you're going uphill a little bit more and it's gonna be a little bit harder. So always recommend keeping the base a little bit in, gravity assisted, moving the base a little bit out, now it's against gravity slightly. Still technically gravity eliminated because of the motion we're going parallel to the floor, but you can manipulate that just a little bit to modify or change the difficulty of the exercise in this stage. So again, keeping that elbow in and you're just letting that hand fall out. Big picture concept number one, set yourself up for success. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Don't overwhelm your program with tons of different movements. I would focus on one or two movements and get those repetitions in. Definitely watch that video that I did on activity-dependent neuroplasticity because I go into that in a little bit more depth, the importance of that repetition. But set yourself up for success in repetition, repetition, repetition. Salience, choose activities that have meaning or importance to you. Choose activities that have a reward. That will further prompt that intrinsic motivation. So eating, definitely. Our brains are hardwired to want food. So that is a great time to practice. Doing that in combination with finding ways to make it easy is the best combination. So I'm a fan of some adaptive equipment, 
a mobile arm support, which kind of supports your arm. That Those are expensive, but definitely extremely valuable. Most therapy, neurotherapy centers have those. So that is a great way to set yourself up for success. So if you're not going to OT or PT and you used to go and they had something called a mobile arm support, which suspends your arm and makes it easier to move your arm and get your arm to your mouth, definitely maybe get back into therapy. But in addition to repetition, repetition, repetition is mental imagery. They've seen that that lights up or gets that somatosensory area that receives a lot of information from the body. They do see more activity in that area. And to a lesser degree, they also do see some activity in those motor areas of the brain. Just by visualizing yourself going through a movement or watching even watching other people do a specific movement it has that same benefit benefit. So when you're not in therapy and you're not doing your exercises at home, definitely doing mental imagery and just visualizing yourself going through those movements. The other thing is mirror therapy. There is some value and some benefit in doing mirror therapy. Again, that somatosensory area that seems to wake up a little bit more. So you put a mirror that reflects your strong arm and you do movements with that arm. Now you do have to be really engaged. I have seen people and I've had people in my clinic that have some issues att ma maintaining attention and I definitely don't think that if you can't attend to that activity and really watch your arm or your hand moving and doing tasks in the mirror, then it's probably not really beneficial. But yes, paying attention, watching your hand move in the mirror kind of tells the brain that tricks the brain almost into thinking that that involved arm is moving. So very valuable technique. I will put a link in the description for a mirror box. They're pretty cheap. And so they're definitely, that's definitely a useful therapeutic activity. The other one is constraint induced movement therapy. And that's really just where you restrain your involved arm. The other way we describe that is kind of like forced use of the involved arm. Now this one's a little bit more difficult because we still wanna be able to set you up for success. So if you have zero arm movement, then this isn't really effective. But if you have some arm movement, restraining that arm, some protocols are for up to six hours a day. Uh, you can buy a boxing glove. That's what I use in my clinic is I just put a boxing glove on the involved arm so that someone can't use their digits. And that seems to kind of suppress that area of the brain, the opposite side, the intact side of the brain. And what I mean by that is a lot of times when I ask someone to do something with their their involved arm, I will see their other arm trying to do it. And you see that less by just having something on that arm that discourages that arm from moving. And then there is some data that suggests TENS, especially for that somatosensory area of the brain, will help to kind of get more information into the brain, kind of tell your brain that there is an arm over there, there is a leg over there. So definitely has its purpose. The one thing I would say about it is I wouldn't leave it on for extended periods of time because you will become desensitized to it. So you'll just, if you feel it initially, initially you'll no longer feel it. So it's not something I would leave on for more than like 20 minutes. But yes, there is some data that suggests that TENS will work. The other caveat I would say to that is if you have a lot of spasticity and when you turn that intensity up on the tens, if you see that spasticity kicking in, I think that's counterproductive. So if you see that, don't put it on those areas. Maybe find a different area of the arm or the leg to put it on. So I hope you found those suggestions helpful. Again, the take home message of this video is that you, you, the one that's had damage to your brain or your spinal cord or you have a lesion because of MS, everyone has potential. The degree of potential is different for everyone, but the starting point is you have to believe in yourself and your ability to make progress. So reframe your condition and you never know what is possible. If you're new to this channel, definitely hit that subscribe button, turn on that notification bell. If you haven't started following us yet, definitely head over to Instagram and start following us over there at Rehab HQ Global. We're gonna start posting over there on a pretty regular basis with a little bit of different information than we post on YouTube. In addition to that, I'm gonna mention it again this week. I mentioned it last week. We're starting a live Q&A. The first 
Q&A is going to be on October 27th. It's an opportunity for you to submit questions in advance and I'm gonna answer every single question. It's an affordable way to get a deeper understanding of your exact problems, which really is the foundation in everything we talked about in this video, really having a deeper understanding of what's going on in your brain and how your brain and your body are connecting or not connecting and causing some of your problems, I think is extremely valuable. It's only $5, so I hope you will check it out. Link for that is in the description below. Also, our membership is still going strong. I think I, we're up to over 300 exercises now in the exercise vault. That's kind of our premium product that's offered over on my website. The link for that is in the description below. Super valuable content, especially when it comes to this topic of learned non-use. I pretty much have five modifications for every single movement because I want everyone to be able to find a movement that they can successfully do. That is why I keep so many different modifications in there to reverse this learned non-use, to stop suppressing movements, but to actually attempt a movement, successfully accomplish it, and start to kind of undo that learned non-use. So definitely link is in the description for that as well. Click on that link and you can learn more about that. Also, sign up for our newsletter. Every week I just send out little motivational messages just to kind of get you through your week, something unique that I don't really share on Instagram or YouTube. So link for that to sign up for that free newsletter is also in the description below. And then above and beyond all that, I just really enjoyed spending time with you all this week and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video. You all have a great week.